Welcome back everyone! In this video, we will discuss the music note solo scenario. Having retired my Vermling Mind Thief, I am now playing the music note character in our Gloomhaven campaign, so this guide will cater towards my specific build. In particular, our party has access to item 73 from the random item design deck, so spoiler alert for that along with music note's ability cards and items up to Prosperity 3. Do not proceed further with this video unless you are comfortable with those spoilers. So, here's the TLDR for the solo scenario. Yeah, I was very meticulous in planning out this solo scenario because I really wanted to maximize my odds of concurring it on the first try. But don't worry about deciphering my cryptic text, we'll explain this in detail in the video. But first, let's look at the solo scenario layout. As you'll notice, the objective of this scenario is to kill the elite Vermling Shaman at the end of the scenario on the left. Now, any time the scenario objective isn't kill all enemies, we've got to see if there's potential for exploiting this by taking shortcuts. In this case, even though the scenario layout seems to suggest commanding your squad of bandits through the four rooms, killing all monsters inside, in reality, at some point, we are probably better off ditching them, making a mad dash for the final room, and assassinating the shaman. With that in mind, it is actually best to start solving the scenario from back to front. To kill the elite shaman, what cards do we, do we require? Well, the shaman is a surprisingly squishy enemy, only 5 hit points, oh wait, shield 3. Yeah, uh, it seems this was specifically designed to be near impossible to assassinate with the Soothsinger alone. Your best attack cards in your arsenal at level 5 are Warding Dagger and Melody and Harmony at attack 3, as well as Singeing Arrow that wounds the Shaman, inflicting damage through shield. None of these benefit from your songs, which only buff allies and not yourself. These make for a very slow bleeding out rather than the quick assassination we are looking for. Speed is of the essence here because as a solo assassin, we really cannot take too many hits from the accompanying city guards. At level 6, we get a huge boost in reliably assassinating the shaman in the form of Provoke Terror. While more commonly used for the AoE stun on top, the bottom of Provoke Terror is a powerful attack 4 that we'll lean on for assassinating the shaman here. So these are our attacks, but how do we position ourselves in the boss chamber? Jumping into melee range of the shaman seems like a good idea, giving us access to warding dagger as a top attack. This comes at a cost. Our two range attacks will be at disadvantage, making this a suboptimal plan. Instead, we will aim to fire ranged attacks from this hex. Now, we have to contend with moving into this room. As you are aware, the Sooth Singer has no top move actions, so a bottom move action must be used to breach the boss's chamber. Which is suboptimal, because we want to use our most powerful attack, Provoke Terror, as our first. To solve this problem, we'll turn to the random design item that our party acquired in our campaign, Blinking Cape. This allows us to perform a move 4 jump on our turn, in addition to our usual top and bottom actions. What a perfect way to set up Provoke Terror. As long as we begin our turn within range 3 of the door. Or actually, even range 4 of the door, I'm sorry. Uh, we can execute our Blinking Cape into Provoke Terror. This leaves us with the question, what is our top action? Well, that's obvious. It's none other than Melody and Harmony. Wait, what? I hear you cry. Why the heck would you play two bottom attack actions in the same turn? The rationale is contingency planning and that really isn't obvious at first glance. There is a significant random element we have to deal with and that's the monster action deck. With rudimentary monsters such as guards, this isn't a big problem, but from prior encounters with Vermling Shamans, I'm aware that the Shaman Modifier deck has some nasty cards. This arm and heels are part of the Shaman's repertoire, an unlucky draw is all it takes for everything to go south. Recall that time is of the essence, we really cannot take too many hits from the city guards waiting for this arm to wear off. To prepare for this worst case scenario, we play Melody and Harmony 
as our alternative bottom act attack card so that we can use the top of Provoke Terror to stun the Shaman in the event it draws the Disarm or the Heal. In the event uh, that our bottom attack action doesn't kill the Shaman, we'll double dip by using our minor stamina potion here to recover Provoke Terror. Um, this allows us to follow up with another ranged attack on our turn. This should hopefully be sufficient to end the Shaman, otherwise we'll have to short rest to recover the ranged attack actions again. I know this sounds like a huge gamble, leaning on 2 attack force to kill through 3 shield and 5 hit points, but the Singer really doesn't have many better alternatives. As such, the remainder of our scenario strategy will revolve around maximizing the chance of killing the Shaman with 2 ranged attack force. For starters, I'll be purchasing a minor power potion from the store, and using it on Provoke Terror's attack 4. Potions are dirt cheap, our party happens to have a high reputation, so it's a small investment that could potentially be a game changer here. Bonus points for helping out with my personal quest. So that's all the items I'll be bringing for this scenario. Yep, the Soothe Singer is fairly item independent, so we are saving all our items for the final room to deal with the Shaman. Now let's move backwards. Room 3 contains a lone elite stone golem. As it turns out, this is practically impossible to kill even with support from our bandit squad. The shield 3 is just far too much for the base attack to our ally's sport, and the golem hits hard as well, easily one hit killing the bandits. We unquestionably avoid eye contact with the stone golem, instead darting towards the final room as quickly as possible. So the plan is, we play a move card to enter room 3, ending our turn somewhere in the room. This sets up for next turn, where we blinking cape towards the goal and execute the plan previously discussed. The cards we need for achieving this are change tempo for movement and throw voice for the top action. The map is by no means small, so having a dedicated big movement card is important for crossing between rooms in general. We would use mobilizing measure here for its move 6 and blazing fast initiative, but we already took melody and harmony as our level 5 card, so change tempo will have to do. The disarm from Throw Voice is sort of an insurance policy. I vaguely remember Stone Golems having immobilizing attacks and those will absolutely ruin our day if they land, preventing us from blinking into the final room. With our breaching and assassination tactics laid out, let's rewind all the way to the beginning. We note that we begin with 6 allies, 4 of which are adjacent to us in the starting formation. Well, that's just convenient. It's as though the ally formation was specifically designed for this opening play. It's as though the game designer <coughs> tuned the outcome. So that's our first turn, no question. As for subsequent turns, we draw insight from looking ahead at room 2. These are the enemies we have to contend with in the first two rooms. If there's one thing you immediately notice they share in common, it's that all the city enemies have shield. Just when you thought you were done with the shielded enemies in the latter rooms, this scenario basically screams your base attack too is going to be very much irrelevant throughout the entire scenario. We could either take this lying down and avoid enemies like the plague, or we could use our secret weapon of mass destruction, power ballet. That's right. This card is low-key the best song in this scenario. Quick mats with a base attack of 2, assuming our allied bandits draw a zero point, uh, plus 0 modifier. Their 2 damage would be reduced to 1, thanks to shield. But with power ballet active, however, they would deal 2 damage. The plus 1 damage from power ballet essentially isn't affected by shield. It is fully effective against the city guards and archers. Against, I should say. Uh, the best part, however, this happens once per ally, for a grand total of 6 additional damage output per turn. This is in contrast to your typical 4 player game, where you only get 3 instances of plus 1 attack every turn. Wonderful. But wait, there's even more. Remember our turn 1 play of saturating our modifier deck with 10 blesses? Our bandit allies are very likely to draw them, and as it turns out, the 2 times from the bless multiplies our power ballet damage as well giving us phenomenal damage output, considering our allies have a base attack of 2 against these shielded enemies. To summarize everything, our job is to simply play power ballet and let our allies do the work. On to positioning. 
we focus on room 2 and the corresponding door opening strategy because we don't have much control over room 1. We let monster AI take care of itself there. Usually, charging into a new room is a good strategy for an offensive team, but not today. The obstacle placement in this room creates a narrow walkway which only permits a maximum of one ally to be in melee range of the elite guard at any time. As a result, we only have three allies hitting the elite per turn, one melee guard and two ranged archers. If, however, we play patiently by baiting the elite to enter the doorway, we increase our attack surface. Two melee guards now have the opportunity to rain attacks alongside our archers, giving us four attacks on the elite per turn. This is significant because the back line of city archers is a formidable offensive unit. With four attacks a turn typically focused on the same bandit, they are capable of taking out one or even two of our bandit allies per turn. We really need to be swift with killing the elite guard so that we can move on to the back line archers before they wipe our squad. Due to monster AI and the map layout, there is absolutely no way we can have our squad jump to the back line to deal with the archers first, even though that's the optimal approach here. Uh, with a standard 4-player Gloomhaven party, for example. One final note, the elite city guard innately has one retaliate. There is nothing we can do about this. Putting up shield with defensive ditty or echoing aria won't stop the retaliate damage. Again, this supports our offensive strategy. We need to kill the elite in as few hits as possible to reduce the total retaliate damage taken. Armed with this background knowledge, we now have all the information needed to pick our 9 cards for battle. The necessity of the cards shown on screen have been explained earlier. To round off our build, we'll need to settle the last remaining card slot. Of the remaining cards, it seems Call to Action is begging to be used in this scenario for the same reason as Power Ballet. 6 instances of Strengthen would really help with dispatching City Guards and Archers, and the attack 4 on the bottom is a big attack value that punches through shield. However, there's a very subtle downside to strengthen here. It chews through your modifier deck twice as fast, removing twice as many blessers. A gentle reminder that the primary objective in the first two rooms is to retain as many blessers in your deck as possible, to maximize the chances of provoke terror and melody and harmony killing the shaman in the final room. So this really leaves us with Echoing Aria as our card of choice. Well, if we have a level 3 card slot available, why not use it? Echoing Aria is a wonderful defensive card for the first two rooms since your squad is taking many instances of 3 to 4 damage. This also gives us a useful bottom action for our opening moves. We are definitely playing Disorienting Dirge into tuning the outcome first, taking advantage of our opening formation to obtain all 10 blessers. This means Power Ballet, despite being a strong offensive song, is delayed to turn 2, where it's paired with Echoing Aria for defense. Throw Voice is a good follow-up action for turn 3, which protects our team from damage, paired with the bottom of Melody and Harmony for our Soof Singer to advance closer to the door. Any remaining city guards will hopefully be picked off by turn 4 with either Provoke Terrors top or bottom, which is also the time we run out of cards in hand. Before advancing to the second room, we'll long rest, losing tuning the outcome, which has served its purpose already. We pick up Power Ballet from the active area here to make an even hand size. This is convenient because on turn 1, we'll be using Change Tempo to open the door, then hastily retreating behind our allies so that the enemy elite guard advances into our room. Retreating to the backline on turn 1, we don't really have any useful top actions to play, so this is a good time to set up Power Ballet again. On turn 2, we go for Echoing Aria to shield against City Archers, whilst Provoke Terror stuns the Elite. We continue disabling the Elite on turn 3 with Throw Voice. At this point, should our allies have drawn and removed many blessers from our modifier deck, we'll reinsert them by playing Disorienting Dirge, otherwise it can hold off until turn 4. By turn 4, the elite guard should have fallen. We can now advance into room 2 with our allies using mel uh, Melody and Harmony on turn 4. We expect to lose Echoing Aria on this long rest because Power Ballet is still needed to deal with the shielded city archers. By this point, I expect that our bandit guards have all been murdered, leaving us with one or two archers to handle the horde. 
Turns 6 and 7 will be all about damage mitigation, chaining disarm into stun to ensure that the enemy city, guard, uh, city archers don't attack. We expect to squeeze another disorienting dirge in here. Every additional bless in the deck makes the final room e easier. Regardless of how the skirmish between our allies and enemies go, we should focus on our objective on turn 8. Here we play change tempo to position ourselves near the door, ready to enter room 3 after a long rest where we lose power ballet. Before we enter room 3, however, we may consider putting up Disorienting Dirge as our song for damage mitigation in the final rooms. It is the only um, song that benefits us since it affects all allies by disadvantaging their attacks. In the unlikely event we manage to subdue the city archers earlier, we may consider playing change tempo earlier than turn 8 and then barging into the next room immediately. From room 3 onwards, it is fairly straightforward by the book. We enter the room with change tempo's movement, planning to disarm the golem with throw voice. The next turn, we go all out pummeling, using Blinking Cape to enter room 4 and unloading our bottom ranged attack on the Shaman, boosted by minor power potion. Not forgetting to recover them with minor stamina potion. Rinse and repeat in subsequent turns until either the Shaman or Sooth Singer dies. And that's the strategy for the solo singer, Sooth Singer scenario, or the SSSS. I know there was a ton of planning for a seemingly straightforward scenario, but here's the thing. Given the objective, it certainly is possible to keep redoing the scenario until you get a lucky draw, hitting a bless or two times against a shaman for a one-hit kill. With this video guide, the aim is to find a strategy that ensures victory most of the time. To put the theory to the test, there is only one way. Tune in next time, where we attempt this on Tabletop Simulator in a playthrough. See ya then.